All right. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vinicius Gix. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the U.S. Army Research Lab. Uh, and today I'll, I'll present to you the, uh, our submission to the Mineral Buzz Out uh, competition, uh, which we call Solving Tasks in Minecraft Using Human Feedback and Knowledge Engineering. Uh, just before anything, I really want to thank uh, the other team members. So Nicholas Waitwich from the Army Research Lab, David Watkins from Columbia University, and Bharat Prakash from the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Uh, so what was really the motivation behind our approach? So uh, we all know, uh, you guys all participate in the competition you saw from the previous presentation, that all the bazaar tasks, they were really like, almost life life tasks. So there was no reward function. So if you, I mean, there's no way to just try like a, your standard RL algorithm that will rely on the reward function. I mean, you could try different variations, but the standard way would just not work. Uh, similar to imitation learning, if you tried end-to-end uh, -end imitation learning, like most of us tried, also there was a baseline for that, you'd see that there are actions that were just simply really rare. So for example, like throwing the snowball would happen once every like 2000 frames. So an end-to-end -end imitation learning would be pretty challenging. Uh, another uh, approach that you know one, one team could take would be just, okay, let's uh, uh, hard code the whole agent to solve all the tasks from beginning to end, uh, just pure on human knowledge, which I mean, could be possible, but maybe feasible and it might just not cover all possible scenarios uh, but that does not mean that those approaches don't have their merit. And that's what we really try to capture uh, uh, in our approach. So what we did was really this hybrid approach. So we combined a rule-based approach, we combined it machine learning and human feedback on top of, of that, just kind of to try to inject, you know, there's an inductive bias in the algorithm, in the architecture, some of the human domain knowledge of the task and additional human feedback to leverage uh, all the our machine learning modules. Uh, so just pretty quick, uh, just a gist of our approach. Uh, this, this diagram captures it. I know there's a lot to digest, so uh, let me go here step by step. So we really started by you know just having access to the Minecraft simulator and the human demonstrations provided by the organizers. So that was our starting point. Uh, but really like the brain of our approach, which controls everything is the state machine. So what the state machine does is essentially select which subtask should be followed at a given time. So it's like a hierarchical approach. Uh, but then like, how, how do you do the selection, right? So the way we uh, did this was using the state classifier and the state classifier was trained with additional human labels. So what it basically does, it kind of highlights relevant states uh, in the environment. And then given that, we also, uh, we had a lot of experience with uh, robotic research and everything. So we implemented this estimated odometry, which we thought would be pretty relevant to a lot of the tasks. So for example, if you build a pen, it would be nice where, it would be nice to know where you built it. So you can come back with the animals, same with the waterfall and everything. But then, okay, you have your state machines, uh, you can switch between subtasks, right? But how about, how are those subtasks uh, actually implemented, right? And that's where our hybrid approach kind of shows up. So we split the task in a bunch of subtasks. Some of them were uh, uh, engineered, so basically hard-coded by, by humans. But the main one was really just learned it from the human demonstrations. Uh, so from the human demonstrations, we trained this main navigation policy that really guided everything. Uh, so that's kind of the, the gist of it. Now I'll kind of just go kind of diving deep on each one of those modules uh, and hopefully clarify everything. So let's just start with the state classifier. So for the state classifier, we first thought, okay, what will be some relevant states to know about that could be fed to the state machine so it can switch between the different subtasks? So we came up with different, with 12 different states that will be really uh, important to identify. And you can see like some examples right there. So uh, you see uh, in this, this top left image, you know, it would be nice to know if the agent's looking at the cave, you know, it would be nice to know if we're inside the cave or not, if there's any danger ahead, like a huge body of water, if we're looking at the mount mountain and, and things like that. And, and 
So those are all the 12 states that the state classifier is uh, identifying. And to do <coughs> the, the, the state classifier, so it's all learned, so we need the data. So we implemented our own uh, custom labeling GUI. So that will give to our own human labelers and then we'll present them with frame. And the person just went ahead and click on the button to, to label that figure. So in the end, we labeled 82,000 images and then we uh, trained a convolutional neural network architecture with a few uh, fully connected layers to do this state classification, this binary state classification. And on test set, we achieved over 90% accuracy. So we were pretty happy about this, this state classifier. But okay, so let's say you do have the state classifier. Uh, now you can actually control the state machine. So how, how does the state machine actually work? So we define it a, a finite state machine for each task. So that's part of the domain knowledge of, of the task. So the state machine would look at the outputs of the state classifier and simply transition between subtasks. So would select which subtask should be followed. So uh, it will decide which task should be followed or terminated. And I have a big diagram, just, just an example for the make waterfall task. I know there, there's a lot there, uh, but let's kind of just focus a little bit just on the right corner, just to explain a little bit. So this whole diagram, I guess, first of all, the green diamonds are uh, outputs of the state classifier and the blue rectangles are the subtasks that we have implemented. So if you just see around the, 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 the space I marked, so for example, our agent will ask the, the state classifier, are we at the top of the waterfall? And then if the state classifier replies, yes, we are, with over like 50% of certainty, we switch to displace waterfall task. And we had that for all tasks, some were easier, some were more complicated, like the create pen task. Uh, so now that you can switch between subtasks, let's just talk a little bit about how they work. So the really the core of our approach was this uh, navigation policy. And like I said in the beginning of my presentation, if you really try to do end-to-end -end imitation learning, it's probably not gonna work because there are very kind of rare actions like I mentioned, right? But that doesn't mean that the, this data is not useful, right? Uh, if you think about it, uh, the humans are actually pretty good at na navigating environment. So uh, we just don't really think about it, but let's say, Think about on a snowy day, you were just walking on the sidewalk, right? You have your, your eyes looking at the sidewalk. So in your mind, you know which paths are uh, walkable, which paths are not. From this path, you tra trace a trajectory, right? And then you kind of control your muscles to follow this trajectory. So there's a lot going on there. And we thought that we could, you know, even though we cannot do an end-to-end -end imitation learning, we thought what would be like a creative and, and more useful way of using this, uh, this human demonstration. So what we did was we used this human demonstration not to train the whole agent, but just train a navigation module. So like, can we use this uh, human demonstration to just learn how to navigate the environment? And, and to do that, we first mask the action space. So essentially throwing away all the other actions that were not related to movement. So like equipping uh, water buckets, throwing snowballs, we threw away and only kept movement actions like move forward, uh, left, things like that, move the camera and everything. And after we did this pre-process step, uh, we trained the whole uh, behavior cloning model that in this case will just know how to navigate around the environment. Uh, so yes, that was the navigation policy, but we still have a lot of other subtasks, right? Okay, I can <clears throat> learn from the human how to navigate, go to the top of the mountain, but what after that, right? Equipping the water bucket is just a single action that we're, we didn't learn from. So from those subtasks that were hard to learn from data, we had actually uh, uh, hand engineered that. So basically we had a human playing the game using the same actions that the agent had access to. And we just d designed a few uh, action, like a sequence of actions to be taken uh, to perform this subtask. And one example here is for the find cave. So whenever the state classifier detects that we are inside the cave, uh, we simply switch to an end episode subtask, which equips the snowballs and throw it. So whenever we were in a cave, we already know ended the episode, that was it. Uh, another example, like I mentioned, the waterfall. 
So the, the behavior cloning policy would navigate around the mountains and go to the top of them whenever the state classifier said, okay, this, we are at the top of the mountain, then it would switch to this hard-coded policy that would just look down, equip the water bucket and use it. That's what you see there. Uh, same to the, the build house task. So uh, we first needed to know where to build this task, right? And that was really hard to capture from data, but our state classifier was able to identify areas with open space, like you see on this, on this video. So whenever that uh, an open space was identified that was close to the village, we would switch to the build house uh, subtask. Uh, some of those subtasks required more than just looking down and equipping an item. So, uh, for example, when you build a pen, you need to lure the animals, you need to know where the pen is. So what we did, we implemented our own uh, odometry just based on the actions of, of the agent. So from the competition rules, we could not use any data from the Minecraft simulator, right? We could not extract the pose of the agent, nothing like that, right? But that doesn't mean that we, we had nothing, right? So what we had, we had the actions that the human took or not, the actions that the agent took. So like moving forward, backwards, turning the camera. So we knew that. We knew how the simulator worked. So 20 frames per second. So uh, time interval between each frame is 0 0.05 seconds. And also from like the Minecraft wiki, we know that for example, the walking speed is 4.32 meters per second in Minecraft. So if you think about it, if the agent is moving forward and we just pass one frame, so 0 0.05 seconds, if you multiply that by the velocity 4.32, you can know your displacement on the X position. And we did that for X, Y, and for heading, just using a simple point mass kinematics model. So we were able to estimate the position of the agent, X and Y, the heading, and the velocities for all those three quantities. And this really illustrates that. Uh, so there's a lot going on, on the screen. So kind of just look at the left side first. That's kind of like a, the, the bug GUI that we had. So on the left panel, you see the camera feed that's coming to the Asian, right? And on the right side, we, you, you see the map that we built. So there are different components here. So on the top, you see the actions being taken. Uh, there on the, that corner, you see the estimated pose. So you see like X, Y headings all in meters and degrees. Uh, you see the Asian position. So this red dot, you see the past trajectory, which is this white line. And you also see the output of the state classifiers. So you see on the left, all the 12 tasks, oh, the 12 uh, states. And we plotted a few relevant ones on the map. So for example, the blue one is where there was water, so danger ahead. The green one is where we had open space. So in running this in real time, it looks like this. So the agent just keeps walking around the environment. It detects there's an open space. It drops a pin in the map. Uh, if it sees some water, uh, it will plot on the, on the map you see right now. Now there's water in front of the agent. You see some blue being plotted there and, and kind of the position being uh, tracked over time. So that's how it works. Uh, here are just some simple trajectories of our agent and kind of just highlights the, the advantage of the combination of all those techniques. So we know we're inside a cave through the snowball and that's it. We use the navigation policy that was learned from the human to climb the mountain. Whenever the state classifier detects that it was a good location, uh, we simply go ahead and build the waterfall. Uh, same with the create uh, village animal pen. Whenever we detect an open space, we start uh, building the, the pen. Uh, and very similar uh, to the house as well. Navigation policy was used to find uh, the best location and then we'll build the house. Uh, some key takeaways. So this solution uh, actually won the first place, like, like, uh, like Rohin said, the first place and the most human-like agent which we think it attributes to the fact that, you know, we use some human domain knowledge. So uh, the, the agent looked like a human playing the game. And we also learned how to navigate based on the humans. So maybe that felt really natural to the human evaluator. So uh, maybe they thought that was a human playing in the game. Uh, and we're pretty happy to show that this hybrid intelligence solution was able to uh, uh, complete some of the tasks and I think do its best on the other ones. Uh, so uh, some lessons learned. 
uh, just pretty briefly because of time. So it took us a long time to familiarize ourselves with the whole Minecraft environment, how to submit the code, all the pipeline and everything. So if you're looking to participate next year, maybe kind of just start now, <laughs> just download MineRL, start playing with that because like for real, it took, it took us like a month. Uh, uh, so the second thing is uh, the, this combination of working with human feedback and low resolution image was pretty difficult to us. Uh, so like you saw in my presentation, we had our human labelers kind of classify some states. And sometimes we would see like a very tiny, tiny like white blob we didn't know if that was a chicken or a white flower. So it was like, oh, do I label that as has animals or, or not, nothing? So it was a very complicated uh, to work with that. So maybe like this is to the organizers, maybe allow the participants to use the full resolution image. But I mean, I do understand that, you know, it might be more expensive to, to run the simulators and, and everything. Cause so it could be more expensive to run uh, the simulators, uh, uh, the, the whole competition. So uh, we do understand um, why, why this decision was made. Um, but yeah, so big thank you uh, to all the organizers. They were always super helpful on Discord, answering all the questions, everything. Uh, thanks to, again to all the Kairos team members. They're, they are all here on the presentation today. Uh, our whole code base is open source. So take a look there, uh, including the agent we submitted to the competition, plus some other different baselines that we were exploring. Uh, we tried to put all that together on a paper. So that went online, I think, yesterday. So this link should be working. So take a look there as well. And if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to ask now or, or shoot me an email later. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Feel free to just unmute and speak. All right, um, maybe I get to ask the first question then. Okay. So I'm curious. So, so I I really like the the state machine uh, approach. It makes a lot of sense to me. I'm curious how long it took to devise the state machines for each of the tasks. Was it like you just wrote your first attempt at the state machine and it worked beautifully, or did you like iterate, <laughs> do like five or ten different ones of them? Uh so first yeah i think uh like to actually devise the state machine i mean first it took some time right but i think the part that took the most amount of time was to actually go ahead and implement and test each of the subtasks uh and we and we were not able to fully implement the state machine that we wanted so for example for the animal pen task uh our classifier was able to detect if there was an animal in the image or not right but there could be multiple time, times, uh, types of animals, could be sheep, cow, chicken, right? And it turns out they all eat different food. So like, okay, we'll go use the odometry, go to the state machine, we'll say, okay, go to the last animal that you saw, the agent will go there, but then now what, right? Uh, how, we should have another classifier yeah. to select the food or anything like that. So it became really time uh, consuming to implement and try those things uh, in the simulator. Yeah, that makes sense. 